And I'm also happy to see so many people in the room and hopefully a lot of people following online as well. It's really nice that, that there is some interest in the topic. I've added space to the title of the presentation because a lot of what I will talk about is, is related to space technology today. A hundred years ago, we also used space observations in geodesy. That was using this observatory, which is, you can see in the logo here, which is part of the original old building at KTH. It isn't used anymore. But it was used in, in geodesy for doing astronomic observations back then. So before continuing, what is geodesy? See, geodesy is the science of the, the size and the, the shape of the Earth. The Earth is a little flat, it's not completely spherical. Um, and we also work with the, the gravity field of the Earth. So basically what we do is it, the, the field of geodesy covers both theory, we work with a lot of equations, a lot of math. Uh, it's also around technology, instrumentation, uh, we develop instruments as well. And it's about practice or procedures, I would call it, where we combine the theory with the instruments or the technology and come up with new ways or better ways of using it in combination. Many of you will know geodetic observation techniques or geodetic measurements from land surveying. You've seen a land surveyor in a construction site along a, a highway where they're doing maintenance work, for instance. Uh, but that's only a smaller part of, of the field of geodesy. We've had geodesy at KTH since 1877, or we've had separate courses in, in geodesy since then. Um, geodesy was part of other courses previously, but this is the time where we saw separate courses in geodesy. And this was at the same time when we had the first geodesist employed at, at KTH, Edward Yaderin. He did some uh, research uh, back then in uh, measuring distances. But originally, these distances, or back then, distances were measured using steel tapes. But he started using the Invar alloy instead of steel, because steel is quite uh, sensitive to temperature changes. So when you want to measure a distance, it's nice to have something which is a little bit more resistant to changes in temperature. And he came up with a new method of using this Invar thread, so Invar tape, for, for distance measurements. Uh, he retired in 1917, 100 years ago. So this kind of introduces what I'm, I'm binding this presentation on 1917, what we did then, and 2017, what we do today, 100 years later. And it's all related to, to research uh, in geodesy. Um, so when Yaderin retired, this guy, Trygve Robin, became uh, acting professor at KTH in 1917. Um, he had had quite an experience or quite an exciting life before he came to KTH as a full-time teacher. Um, he uh, is a Stockholm or was a Stockholm boy. He grew up in Stockholm. He loved playing outside as a child, running in the streets. And at night, he would watch the stars in the sky and he really dreamt of becoming an astronomer. So he did well in school and he went to Uppsala University and studied natural sciences uh, when he finished high school. And then he, he combined that with some studies in astronomy and, and geodesy at, uh, at KTH and in Stockholm. And in, when he was uh, 23 years old, he got a job at Uppsala University as an ast or helped out as an assistant uh, with the astronomical observations. Then he heard about this expedition which was being planned to take place 1899. It was uh, uh, planned and, and uh, managed by this Edvard Jaderin, who was still working at KTH as an associate professor. And uh, Trygve Robin really wanted to join this expedition. Um, so he did a lot of lobbying work to, to be able to join the exhibition and he was allowed to join it as an assistant when they took off from Sweden in 1899. Um, I think one of the, or some of the reasons why he wanted to go is because it was an opportunity for him to combine observations, astronomical observations, uh, with his, his, uh, he, this thing that he liked being outdoors. So he could combine his, his interest in astronomy with outdoor field work. But then another thing to keep in mind is that this era was also an era where going to the Arctic, exploring 
trying to find the North Pole or the South Pole was really hot. These were the superheroes of the time. These were these people who went, like Richard Perry, who went up to find the North Pole, the Norwegians, Amundsen and, uh, and Nansen, and the British, uh, Ernst Shackleton, who was actually the same age as, as Tryggve Robin. He probably hadn't started his, his work at this point in time. But going to the Arctic was really something a lot of young people wanted to do at this point in time. So Tryggve Robin was... was uh, 23 years old and uh, 24 years old at this point in time and, and was able to join the exhibition to Sorgfjorden, which is on the northern, most northern part of Spitsbergen, this Norwegian group of, of islands uh, called Svalbard. And Tryggve Robin was the first two years he was an assistant. Uh, they spent the first winter up there. They had a lot of equipment, brought equipment with us, and they could build this basically living quarters. They have work workshops for and observation places, and they also had this little, little wash house out there, which was built so they could stay and spend the full winter, even though the climate up there is really rough in the winter. But they managed to do that and did observations, mostly during the summer, of course, but also during the winter. And uh, then the next summer, uh, 19, the summer of 1900, they went back to Sweden. And the following two years, they went back to Spitsbergen again and redid observations and measurements up there. And the second, on the second trip, Trygg Verobin was promoted to the title of astronomer. And on the last, during the last summer, he was actually leading the exhibition. Um, so the purpose of the exhibition, it was called an Meridian Arc exhibition, and a Meridian Arc is, is one of these lines that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. That's called a Meridian. And what they wanted to do with the Meridian Arc exhibition was to measure the curvature of the Meridian. And there had been a number of Meridian Arc exhibitions previously, uh, the last 50 years uh, before this uh, exhibition where they've done these kind of observations at various places around the world. But this would be the most northern uh, Meridian Arc exhibition. So that was kind of the overall goal with the exhibition. They did a lot of other things as well, but, but this was the overall all goal um, for going up there. And the exhibition was, was rather successful in the way that they achieved their goals uh, with the exhibition. Trygve Robin came back home. Uh, 1902, went back to Uppsala University, did his PhD, and then immediately took off to Africa to, to lead another uh, Meridian Arc exhibition in what was called Rhodesia. It's a uh, part of Zambia uh, today, where he spent the next four years. That was a really tough expedition in another way because some of the staff were starving and he got malaria and a lot of things happened. Um, but this is kind of the background. He then came to KTH in, in 1917 and, of course, had a lot of good stories to tell his students when he was teaching classes. He was rather popular among the students. He was also a tough teacher, but he was relatively popular anyway. So if we go uh, 100 years forward in time to 2017, this summer, uh, there was another exhibition led by people from KTH going up to the same place in Sorgfjorden, the island of Spitsbergen, um, this summer. It was uh, an exhibition which was uh, with, with people from, from my division, Geodetic, the Division of Geodesy, and with people from the Division of the History of Science and Technology at KTH. So it was a joint work with uh, people from Geodesy who would look into developing new methods for uh, documenting or, or mapping archaeological uh, leftovers and the, the archaeologists who went, they would have the one purpose of documenting whatever was left from this exhibition. So this is the wash house that I pointed out in the previous slide, which this is what is left of it today. Um, and one of the things with this, uh, this expedition this summer was to try to document as good as possible whatever was left. So a lot of different things were tested or different technologies were tested, like laser scanning. This is a point cloud from laser scanning where you can see color images. Of, it's colored regarding uh, or for intensity of the, the laser points that are sent out from the instrument and then reflected by the objects. Um, this can then be, be processed in different ways, so you can generate 3D models, so you can actually do uh, measurements in that on the computer screen and walk into the building and, and so on. And this is really cool for the archaeologists to, to study. You can also add another color scale and then you have colors that look much more like the photograph. Uh, and the data here is, is cleaned a little bit more so you get a more real-life image, but it's still the laser data uh, results of the laser scanning which is used here. 
Other things that were, other methodologies that were tested this summer um, was uh, the use of auto photographs. These are photos taken above from, from a drone or UAV. Um, but these auto photos are geometrically corrected. If you want to do measurements in a photograph, they would always be distorted by the edges of the picture. But when you do this geometrical correction of the photographs, then you can actually do measurements in it afterwards to measure dimensions of things in the photograph. Um, also, uh, GPS or GNSS technology was used up there. One of the things they, they did this summer was to re-measure some of the distances that were measured using this INVAR technique for distance measurements, which was uh, invented at KTH in, in the, the late 1800s. Uh, they re-measured some of these distances using uh, GNSS satellite technology. Um, and this is... Uh, the kind of instruments we use in this case, this instrument or this antenna is tracking both the American GPS satellite signals and the Russian GLONASS satellite signals. Uh, this is an old, um, uh, this is some of the leftovers from the original expedition where one of these installations they used for doing angular measurements between mountain tops. They would, with these uh, Meridian Arc exhibitions, they would mainly do angular measurements between stars, astronomy, and between mountain tops to have the more terrestrial uh, observations, and then supplemented by, by a few distances. So going back to 1917, it was really an important year for KTH the Odyssey because... Um, this was also the year where uh, Anna Bjerhammer was born. And he was born in uh, Bosta, in the city in the southern part of Sweden. He was also one of these boys who loved playing around outside and who loved watching the stars in the sky at night and dreamt of becoming an astronomer. Um, he was also really good at math, and after he finished high school, he went uh, directly on to KTH and started his engineering studies in the late 1930s. His teacher was then Trygve Rubin, who was still there. This was some of his last years as a professor at KTH before his retirement. Um, and Anne Bjerhammer did some really significant research, which, which is still has quite an importance, not only in Sweden and, and for us, but internationally related to space geodesy today. Um, he spent his entire life, work life at KTH. He came in as a student in the late 1930s and retired in 1983 as a professor. So this was, KTH was really an important place uh, for him. Um, he did a lot of um, research and inventions and in developments. One of the things he came up with was um, also related to measuring distances. Um, this is, today when we measure distances using this kind of land survey technology, we use radio waves. Anne Bjerhammer did not invent that, that was invented during the Second World War, but he came up with a new way of, of modulating these signals when you wanted to use them for, for distance measurements. This invention was, this was in the 1970s, this was patented and the patent was bought by a company in Stockholm. Uh, this, stock, this company is still based in Stockholm and they're still producing this kind of, of total station instruments which measure distances and, and angles. It's uh, owned, americally owned today and one of the world leading, com leading companies within this kind of land survey instruments. They are not using exactly the same methodology as, as Bjerhammer developed and patented in the 1970s, but what they do today is kind of building on, on his work. Another thing he did, um, or other things he did is, among other things, he works with, with the, did some development around the conservation of the energy integral of satellites in orbits, which is important. Some of this work he did is important when we compute uh, the orbits of satellites today. Uh, he also had a lot of ideas on what you could do if you had atomic clocks in satellites. This is ideas he came up with in the, in the late 1960s and 1970s. He didn't come up with the idea of the atomic clocks, but, but he came with suggestions what these atomic clocks could be used for if they were in satellites. And, and two examples here of, of things that are actually implemented which he, today, which he has had ideas around, was if this idea that if you have two satellites that are traveling quite closely to each other in a satellite orbit, and you continuously measure the distance between them, then changes in this distance will give you an indication of changes in the Earth's gravity field because these two satellites would be affected by, by the gravity field in most, almost the same way. 
This is the American GRACE satellite mission, which is building on this idea. It's been in orbit for 15 years, and it will be replaced uh, this early next year. There will be a GRACE follow-on mission being launched uh, by NASA in the US. Another thing that the Bjarne was talking about was to do positioning and navigation using satellites. He did not develop GPS, but he came up with some of the basic ideas, basic ideas which GPS is, is founded on today. So these are, this is an image of the European, of a European Galileo satellite. The European Galileo system is a system which is very similar to the American GPS system as we all use in our smartphones. Um, and, and of course, this is a, a space technology which is used today by, I would say, almost everybody, but we also use it a lot in, in geodetic research. This, this image on the, on the right-hand side, the picture here, is also from, from Spitsbergen this summer, and it's, it's showing the use of, of uh, again, GPS and GLONASS for, for geodetic research today, which is based on, on the GNSS uh, satellite technology. The image on the, on the left-hand side is, um, is a so-called glacial isostatic adjustment model, which was based, developed at, at KTH this summer, so this is also work done uh, this year, 2017. It's based on, it's basically a model of land uplift, and it's based on, on data, a combination of data from, from the GRACE satellite mission, uh, in, in, um, and uh, data from, from GNSS or GPS uh, satellites. There are a number of, of permanent GPS or GNSS stations uh, around the world, and a number of these stations are w as well in North America. And these stations do continuously collect uh, data from the, the GPS satellites and the satellites from the GLONASS and Galileo and Beidou systems as well. And when we have this installation of, of a permanent GNSS station, which is continuously collecting data and continuously determining its position, then you get an idea about land motion, geodynamic activity. You can look at how the horizontal movements, and you can also look at changes in the height using these long time series of, of GPS data. So combining these uh, GPS data or GNSS data with um, uh, observations of changes in the gravity field, then you can develop a model like this that, that illustrates uh, land uh, uplift. And with respect to, to the, the GPS or GNSS observations uh, carried out uh, on, on Svalbard this summer, um, these, these are used, in, in this case, this is uh, uh, a, a local setup with, with what we refer to as real-time kinematic positioning. So there's, there must be a reference system or reference station somewhere in order to determine precise positions with, with GNSS. So you either have these permanent stations that are continuously logging data, or you have a reference station located somewhere which is transmitting correction data to the receiver that the user is using. And this is necessary with the technology we have today to account for a lot of the atmospheric effects on the satellite signals. So this is... Um, this was some work done today, which is, is building directly on some of the previous uh, research done at KTH. So you could kind of, or I will try to summarize a little bit uh, in this uh, last slide. If we're looking back again to 1917, 100 years ago, um, and some of the examples of, of data sources, I would call it, that, that we use in geodetic research or in geodesy. Back then, we used uh, mostly angular observations, these terrestrial angular observations between mountain tops. You would have an instrument that measure angles between mountain tops. Uh, and it should be mountain tops because you should be able to stand on the tops and look to the other mountain, so you wouldn't be, the view wouldn't be restricted by forests and, and buildings and so on. Uh, this was used in combination with a lot of astronomical observations to, to stars, mainly. Um, also, some distance measurements were done, but, but back then we were much better at measuring distances than, or angles than to measure distances in terms of uncertainty. Uh, today, in 2017, we uh, almost exclusive, exclusively use um, satellite technology or satellite-based data. The GNSS systems that I've talked about, like the American GPS and the, the European Galileo system, there's also a Russian system, GLONASS and the Chinese Beidou system. They all, when we talk about them together, we say GNSS or Global Navigation Satellite Systems.
They are used a lot for various geodetic research purposes. Satellite gravimetry, I showed you image, showed images of the um, American GRACE mission. I mentioned the GRACE follow-on mission, which is coming next year. There's also a GOES mission, which is launched uh, by the European Space Agency, uh, a, mainly a European mission, which is also for, for determining changes in the gravity field of the Earth using, using satellites. So how about the future? What do we expect in the next 100 or in the next 200 years even? Um, I added a question mark here because I think when you're looking at the development which has taken place during the last 100 years, it's really difficult to predict what will happen in the next 100 or 200 years. But I, I think that there will still be a need for, for geodesy uh, and the geodetic observation techniques. Um, given that the methodology we use for modeling the Earth today, of course, can be used for modeling any other planets where it's already being tested to use to gravity field models for Mars, for instance. And as we continue with the space uh, exploration and, and exploitation in the future, I'm pretty sure that there will also be lots of needs for this kind of, of geodetic activities in the next 100 or even 200 years. Thank you.